Hello, dear students. My name is Jim Hugel. I'm provost here at Northwest University, and I'm pleased to, uh, pleased to be here for our Faith and Society Speaker Series. I'm, uh, look at this thing I found today, this new technology I have. It folds right up in my pocket. It's amazing. Anyway, the Faith and Society speaking series, Speaker Series is an annual event at Northwest where we try to bring leaders from various fields to campus. And we have two goals in this. Uh, the first is to introduce you, members of our community, to people who are not in full-time church work, but who God is using from a different vocational platform to make a difference in this world for his kingdom. And secondly, the second goal is to excite you with the idea that perhaps God wants to shape you, shape your life. Uh, perhaps God could be calling you to have a similar kind of national platform uh, in your vocation. This year, I'm really pleased to have Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott as our speakers. Les and Leslie first drew national attention from a premarital counseling book called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. S-Y-M-B-I-S, Symbus, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. Since that time, Symbus has grown into an industry of pre-marriage counseling, training for pre-marriage mentors. Over a million, uh, a million couples have gone through the Symbus process as they are uh, preparing to get married. And, and research indicates that because of this, Hundreds of thousands of, marriage, of, of divorces have not happened because of the pre-marriage work um, that has been done through saving your marriage before it starts. I think a lot of us in this room understand the pain of divorce. We've probably experienced it ourselves. And many of us have experienced it ourselves one way or the other. Can you imagine... Can you imagine God using you to make sure that those divorces, that that many divorces have not happened? It's an incredible, it's an incredible gift and it's an incredible ministry. Um, they've written all kinds of books together. We'll name them more tonight, including a book called Healthy Me, Healthy Us. It's going to be the basis of their talk tonight. The scope of uh, Les and Leslie Parrott's uh, influence is just astounding. They've been featured on all kinds of national TV shows. They uh, are co-founders of eHarmony. They're not only getting people married, they're getting them together. They, they uh, have been involved in so many things. They've impacted so many lives. It's really my pleasure to welcome them to Northwest University. Please join me in welcoming them. Well, welcome, you guys. I cannot tell you how glad I am. We tried to do this a year ago, and COVID got in the way. And, uh, and as I said, our goal here, part of our goal here is to give students a sense of how is it, how is it that God gets somebody from here to there? Uh, and, uh, and so I want to I, I just ask you some questions. First of all, where did you guys meet each other, and how did that all happen? Well, before we even answer the question, Jim, can I just say uh, thanks for the honor of getting to do this and uh, to be on this campus. I hope we're on a lot of college campuses, and I hope you know what a special place this is here in Kirkland. And it's, for sure. a, it's a beacon on the hill in Seattle. And uh, don't, don't let this kind of slip through your fingers, because it's easy to do that when you're in college and you have the goal to, to graduate and all that. You're going to come out of here with some of the best friends that you'll have the rest of your lives. You're gonna come out of here with uh, a degree that's gonna help you in your career, and you're gonna come out of here being closer to God. So I just had to put that out there before <laughs> I answered anything else. So, but how did we meet? Well, for us, you may have noticed we have the same name. I'm Leslie, he's Leslie. That actually is how we met. We uh, were on a... It's even more confusing because <laughs> I am, my dad's name is Leslie, and my grandfather's name is Leslie. Yes. And then I married a Leslie. Yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, By the way, that's why we named our first son John. <laughs> John Leslie. 
The first day we noticed we had the same name, we were on a ski trip with a bunch of Christian teens in Colorado, and somebody hollered out Leslie, and we both swished over to the chairlift thinking it was us. And we met in that moment and uh, enjoyed that trip. We didn't see each other for a while after that. Actually, I think you got pneumonia right after that trip. Yes. Um, and I didn't know you well enough to even care at that point. <laughs> but, um, but very soon after that, we started dating and we literally um, enjoyed that dating experience yeah, all so the way through. we dated through high school yeah. and college, and then we got married, uh, I think a week after graduation from yep. college. Right. Yeah. So you went to college together. Yeah. And oh my goodness, uh, well well done. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> so when you guys started college, you know, seniors in high school into college, what was your sense then of what God wanted you to do, what your calling was? Uh, where were you? Where did you think you were headed at mm -hmm. that time? Well, in college, um, in those early years, I was setting out to be a traditional pastor. That's what I my call was, and. Uh, um, uh, fair kind of, you know, warning, I need to let you know, we came from a home that really, I came from a home that really believed in Christian higher education and uh, a line of university presidents. In fact, my grandfather uh, grew up in a log cabin in the eastern hills of Tennessee and as a kid walked barefoot to find a Christian college, found one in Oklahoma City. Uh, he had less than a dollar in his pocket, and uh, he later became the president of that university. Um, and uh, that started a trajectory in our mm -hmm. family that uh, continues to this day. I have two older brothers, they're both in Christian higher ed, and my dad was a university president too. And so I uh, really believed in that, and I thought, uh, I wanna be a pastor, but uh, in my home we always felt like uh, theology operated in a vacuum if it wasn't related to human understanding. So I double majored in psychology, and theology. And uh, uh, to be honest, Jim, when, when we went to graduate school, I, we went to Fuller Seminary because I was you know, going to get a degree in theology, but I was also earning a PhD in psychology at the same time. It's the only school in the world that does that. And at that time. At that time, and it's approved by the APA and all the rest. Yeah. And um, I started doing, I had a, a, an academic mentor, his name is Arch Hart, and um, he, is, he was world-renowned for his work in uh, hazards of ministry. And so pastors would come from around the world to take his course at this seminary. And so as his teaching assistant, I did group therapy for pastors in the afternoon. And it was in that experience after two years of doing that that I realized this is a really, really difficult profession. <laughs> and these guys are really unhealthy. And... Uh, <laughs> And it was kind of a bit of a pivot point for me in realizing that maybe my call wasn't traditional pastoral ministry. And uh, It wasn't because you lacked courage. I think it was because you started assessing what gifts has God yeah, given me and I realized, do I have shepherding gifts? And yeah. no, the answer was no. I am not a shepherd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and what I realized is I like to teach, and that's yeah. how uh, we kind of went down that path together. Yeah. And, and similarly, I grew up as a pastor's kid, um, loved the church from day one, um, so anticipated traditional church ministry as, as our relationship unfolded. One of the things I was always grateful for was that um, through example, I saw couples serving together. And I also read a, a, a biography early on that gave me a model for ministry of William and Catherine Booth. Have any of you ever heard of William and Catherine Booth, founders of the Salvation Army? And I loved the spirit of their partnership. So we always saw ourselves in partnership. Um, but when it came to college, I um, the only thing I knew about myself was that I my passion was deep conversations, and I never felt more fulfilled than when I was in one and that I got the most affirmation after listening deeply to people. So I majored in psychology. Um, that, that's all I knew at that point in my life. And boy, am I thankful for even just the earliest inklings that got me on a path toward our life call. You know, what you're just saying sends me off in two directions. But I, So I'll go to this one first and the next one next. But um, first of all, as you guys were developing in this way, where did, how did you wind up being, fo uh, how did you wind up focusing on marriage and 
pre-marriage and how did relationships become your thing? Yeah. Rather than like, you know, counseling broken pastors in, in yeah. the room back. Yeah. Well, um, when uh, we came out of graduate school in Los Angeles and uh, I got a, a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And so I was working at, at Harborview and I was on the burn unit and I was on the head injury unit, two of the t most intense places in a hospital. And uh, so I was doing that, and at the same time, I applied for an opening at a, at a position at another Christian college here in town, Seattle Pacific, and uh, began teaching there. And uh, Leslie became career counselor in mm -hmm. the career center there yep. at the same time. So we were just fresh out of graduate school. And I was coming home at night with all these crazy stories of patients that I encountered that day at work, and I realized this is a really dark kind of thing. And uh, and uh, I was so much, I was enjoying the teaching far more than my, my <laughs> postdoc fellowship. And, um, and so anyway, I think in the, it must have been around end of January, some students on the campus said, hey, would you, uh, would you come over to one of our residence halls and give a talk on how to fall in love without losing your mind? And uh, they asked us, because we were psychologists. Yeah. And that was the title they gave us. And uh, we said, sure. They said, we're gonna do it just before Valentine's Day. And, and I said, how many students will be there? They said, oh, maybe a, a dozen we usually have. If, if it's a good night, maybe 20. It's just our hall up there on the, in one of, the, one of the dorms. And we said, great. And it was like 10 o'clock at night. And so we, we came uh, to the residence hall that night to give our talk on how to fall in love without losing your mind. And, um, and we saw this huge line out the residence hall, I mean like down the street, and it was rainy, and all these students lined up, and I thought, wow, I wonder what's going on here. And uh, it turned out they put some signs up around campus with that title, and uh, all these students showed up for it. And it just was, the, the need became so palpable mm -hmm. in that moment that we realized our students were starving for information on healthy relationships. And that was another big pivot point mm -hmm. in our lives. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and that call within the call. So, and then when it comes to relationships, we kind of felt a call to marriage preparation, partly because of our own journey. Yeah. Um, here we were, we dated several years, but, um, and knowing each other well, like I said, I came from a pastor's family, less to, but uh, we got married without even one day of premarital counseling. Yeah, in fact, the very first sentence of our book, <laughs> Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, says we never had premarriage counseling, but we spent the first year of our marriage in therapy. And that's the truth. Yep. And so we struggled that first year, even after dating for seven years. And, uh, and so we brought that into this whole thing too. Right. But, but it was once we saw... These students, this was not like part of the grand plan. This is not something we thought uh, in high school or college. This <laughs> is gonna, what we're going to do with our yeah. lives. And so it really came out of meeting a need that we saw that nobody else mm -hmm. was meeting. And so later that spring, uh, we held our first event for couples on a campus much like this uh, that were preparing for lifelong love. And uh, we called it Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. And again, we had a pretty good turnout for that. And we did it the next year. And then the third year, we didn't have room on our campus to hold enough people that were showing up for this thing. And then we eventually wrote a book by that title, and that changed everything. Wow. Well, you guys have a very, uh, it's maybe not totally unique, but pretty unique style. I mean, you speak all over the country in all kinds of venues as a partnership. How did that, how did that develop? How has that grown? And what have you learned from from deciding to take that approach of actually speaking as a team. Yeah, it's kind of fun being a partner because so often when you go to a lecture or a lesson on marriage, it's just one person in the relationship giving the talk and that's valuable. But what happens when you're both there is this deep level of honesty and authenticity that you get because you're doing it together and you're speaking out of your experience. One of the things I think we felt early on in all of our teaching was we didn't just want to share principles about great relationships. We wanted to share as a couple doing everything we knew to put them into practice. Yeah, we, we often said, Jim, that we wanted to be uh, pilgrims, not proclaimers. Yeah. In other words, we... We are pilgrims. Yeah, yeah. we didn't want to stand up on a platform yeah. and say, hey, do it exactly like we do. In fact, uh, 
Uh, one of our great mentors, his name was Gary Smalley, um, and, and Gary uh, said, you know, it's an incredible thing because we make our living going around the country talking about our mistakes. And uh, <laughs> that's really what we've done yeah. is to share what hasn't worked, what has worked, and see what you can kind of learn from us in our relationship. But, but that idea of being pilgrims, not proclaimers, is, is something we hold on to to this day. Well, I have to say, I was a pastor for 15 years, and on Sunday morning, when I knew I had to speak on Sunday, I would wake up before the whole family and get out of the house, <laughs> so there would be no fighting in my, in my head <laughs> before, uh, before I had to get up and speak on Sunday. So when you guys are driving to a speaking event, <laughs> have you ever had a fight along the way, and how do you deal with that? Oh, yeah. We have. We, we absolutely yeah. have. In fact, there have been times when we've arrived at the venue, I I'm thinking of one in, in Oregon. We were in Remember Portland. That? We drove down from <laughs> Seattle to Portland, and this is at a large church down there. Yeah. And uh, this is before uh, cell phones and stuff, and uh, so we didn't have like a, a car that would direct us. And so we no were GPS, at, yeah. looking at maps and stuff to find this church. And it was just a, we were just crossways on directions that happens with And the stress sometimes. of getting there on time. And so uh, yeah. Leslie's actually breaking down into tears as we're pulling up into the church. And there was this huge billboard on the freeway. And it said, uh, becoming soulmates with doctors Les and Leslie Parrott. And had our pictures and we were hugging each other. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Leslie said, just keep driving. I'm not ready to go to this church. So, um, but yeah, yeah we've had that. But that's part, of the, that's, that's part of the authenticity, right? Yeah. That's uh, the accountability. I remember once we were speaking at, uh, well, I was speaking in uh, Chicago at uh, the, um, what's the big arena where they play basketball there? Uh, you know, where Michael Jordan played basketball. What's it called? United Center? Whatever it is. And it was just huge. And it was filled with people. And I was one of the other speakers of, of several that day. And Leslie uh, was at home in the hospital because we were expecting our first child. And this little guy had lots of complications. And so um, we actually piped her in on the big <laughs> screens from her hospital bed in Chicago because that accountability is so important to us. And so it, it's, it's one thing to stand up as a single person, as an individual, and talk about relationships and marriage. It's another thing to, to be up there with your spouse because there's a built-in accountability to that, authenticity for it. The, um, so it sounds like, as you said, it, this wasn't a grand plan. It was really seeing needs and what, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of following in obedience to doors that God yeah. is opening up all along the way. At some point, and I often think about Billy Graham, you know, growing up and, and getting more and more speaking events and, and his influence is growing. And at some point, Billy Graham had to realize, I think God is calling me to be that Billy Graham. You know, I, I, the Billy Graham that we all know as Billy Graham. And he had to... He had to accept that. He had to lean into that idea that that's what God, how God was going to use him, and he was going to be willing to be used in that way. I suspect you guys have gone through a similar process. You have a national platform. You've influenced so many people. You do every single year um, through books and through speaking. When did you realize that you were going to be that less and Leslie Parrott? And... and what was the process like of allowing God to use you in that way? Hmm. Well, first of all, we're not Billy Graham. Yeah. So, so. Well, let's get, <laughs> no. let, let's but you are less and Leslie <laughs> Parrott. And. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it happened to us. It wasn't, as we've already said, it wasn't anything we planned that we began to recognize, wow, things are happening so that our our influence is spreading. Yeah, and it was it was pretty sudden because, yeah. like I said, uh, the continuation of that story. You know, we spoke in the residence hall that, later that spring. We did the Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts event. Three years later, we wrote a book by that title. Uh, well, lo and behold, we get a call from Oprah Winfrey. Said, "Will you come on our program and, and talk about that book?" Um, interesting that you mentioned Billy Graham because Billy Graham was the other guest. On I that, know that program. Really? Yeah, yeah, that you was... got to be on the platform with <laughs> Billy Graham. Yeah, yeah. Was... I am. And so, so jealous. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that was just like a, a, a catapult, um, you know, because of her, her platform and, and visibility, um, especially with that program back then. And so it just changed everything. And suddenly we were on 
uh, program with, we were on The View with Barbara Walters. We were on uh, the Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. I mean, it was just on down the line, David Letterman, you name it. And so we were just doing all these programs and suddenly we realized we have a national platform. We didn't design this. We didn't set off to do this. We just wrote a book and, and, and we're trying to meet a need that nobody else was meeting. And uh, so that, when that began to happen, we realized it was really important to surround ourselves mm -hmm. with people that would make sure that we were not um, wasting this opportunity. And so we had some wise people that we invited to speak into our lives just by asking them mm -hmm. and uh, saying, would you come alongside us and help us and, and keep us balanced and, and do what we need to do? And out of that, we, we kind of honed, do um, you guys know what a BHAG is? You ever heard of a BHAG? How many business majors do we have in the audience? You know what a BHAG is. A BHAG is a big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> and so we realized that once we had this momentum in our own ministry, that we, we wanted to realize what can we do that will really make a dent in this world. And uh, so our BHAG is to see the uh, divorce rate reduced by a third in our lifetime, mm -hmm. particularly in local churches, but beyond that too. And do you know that for every single percentage point that you drop the divorce rate, the lives of more than a million children are positively impacted? Yeah. That's for one single percentage point. Imagine if we got to double digits. It'd be one of the greatest social revolutions the church has ever seen, and it would impact generations. And so that's really what drives us. And out of that kind of, you know, sudden national platform, we realize that's what we can dedicate our lives to. Well, and I would just add to that, one of the great joys of how things unfolded in, in God's wisdom was that we, even though we had been raised in Christian circles and loved the church, we recognized that God was giving us some influence from the center, but out, outward. And so we always had a dream that we would take, you know, the, the deep ancient wisdom of God's word and principles but but let it spread, you know? And so we wanted to unwrap it and make it accessible to people so that they would be drawn to God's principles. Yeah, there's a psychologist named uh, Martin Seligman, and, and uh, he was president of the APA, the American Psychological Association. And in his initial uh, remarks as becoming president of that organization, he, he, he used the phrase, uh, we need to be giving psychology away. And uh, that resonated with us. And so we uh, really, it's, it's, it's been integrating psychology and theology. That original kind of call on our lives continues to this day. It just didn't happen in the way that we ever planned it would. Yeah, in kind of a boomerang effect, we wanted to be able to take cutting edge research that wasn't always getting accessed in our ministry circles. Right. So it's kind of nice that we can, we can add both things that can be life-changing beyond sort of the expected. Changing the subject only slightly, you guys have written so many books together. How do you write, uh, people here want to write books. How do you write books anyway? And then how do you write books as a team? Well, <laughs> I just finished one two yep. nights ago. So yep. uh, you're catching me in a great space because <laughs> if I would have said, if you would asked me a week ago, I said, don't write books. It's terrible. It's so <laughs> miserable. Um, but after you write it, you feel, uh, wow, that, that was good. Glad we did that. Um, but it's challenging. It's challenging for an individual to write a book. And then to do that uh, with two voices is, I think, even more yeah. complex. We've both written books on our own. And we've written, Leslie's written children's books, uh, and we've written graduate level textbooks. Most of our books, however, are what we call putting the cookies on the bottom shelf, just self-help books about relationships that are for people that can use them. And uh, Yeah, it can be an interesting process. One of our books was called The Good Fight, and I can remember when we were deep in the heart of that, Les called me into the study one night and said, we really need an illustration for this. Let's, let's remember one of our worst fights. So we talked all about that. And then you were like energized to write about it. And then I went out and cried because <laughs> it was all fresh and raw for me, right? Yeah, I was like, that was a great fight. Yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. write that. Yeah, so it could be an interesting process, yeah. but um, yeah. And I'll tell you what, that when you write together, again, that accountability comes through yeah. because uh, it's real stuff. And you're, in fact, a couple, let's see, three years ago, I wrote a book uh, on my own called Love Like That, 
And uh, when I initially wrote it, it was called Love Like Jesus, and our publisher said, that sounds too Christian. I said, well, you're a Christian publisher, okay, whatever you think. And, uh, but it comes from that verse in Ephesians where Paul describes how Jesus loves, and then he says, love like that. And that little three-word sentence just kind of pierced my heart. How do I love like that? So it sent me off on this trajectory to, to study that a little bit. Anyway, wrote this book. And, and so uh, just to give you a sense of how real life is when you write. And by the way, if you, if you, if you want to give your enemies ammunition, just write a book on how to love like Jesus. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. oh, that my enemy would write a book. <laughs> but uh, anyway, one day I was talking with our son Jackson. And um, uh, shortly after I had this book had come out, and I'd just done an interview, and I think he heard me in my office doing some radio stuff or podcasts or whatever. And anyway, I had this moment with him where I wasn't at my best as a parent, and uh, I could just hear him as he kind of walked away from me, and he said, well, love like that, you know? So <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. it. Do you... Um Thinking back to earlier times in your life, are there, th are there experiences that you feel like God gave you ahead of time that prepared you for the, for the things that you are doing now? Yeah, I love that question. I mean, one of the things I would say, I, I just, first of all, we feel passionately, um, I don't know, inspired for you guys. We're parents. We have an 18-year-old son, a 23-year-old son. We are so in the year season of life. We want you to be dreaming and listening to your passions and uh, leaning into that. For me, one of the formative experiences in my life was one of my early jobs. I was working um, for an incredible guy. His name is Dr. Walter Wright. And early on in my job, he called me into his office. I was a very recent college grad. And he said, um, I need your 10-year plan. So I went out and started looking in my file cabinet out, out there for the 10-year plan. And he started laughing. He goes, I'm not talking about anything about work. This is personal. I need your 10-year plan. And I was like, wow, I don't have a 10-year plan. And he said, well, get one and come back. And that conversation really transformed my life because he got me dreaming and dreaming big, not just, you know, what are our small dreams for right now, but what difference would I like to make with my life? And that was, that was a pretty epic, formative experience, a pivot point for me. And you guys are having those all the time. I know... Even when you just get amazing feedback from a prof on an assignment that takes your breath away or you have someone notice a gift you have, be observant. Take those in. Don't let those, you know, just fall by the wayside. That is rich fruit for you and your dreams. Well, and that goes to something that comes to my mind, and that is to lean into your strengths. Lean into your giftedness. God designed you. Everybody in here is so unique. Your DNA is, is special, and God has created you with special gifts. And, uh, you know, we psychologists like to say awareness is curative. Once you become aware of something, then you can do something about it, or you can do something with it. And so I would say really get to know yourself and how God has gifted you. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask that question, the first place my mind went to, when I was in high school, I remember I had a, a term paper I had to do on the Oregon Trail, and uh, I think it was a five-page paper, and it was to teach us how to use the library and research and, you know, that kind of thing. I got so into that idea of writing a paper at that stage. I wrote a 30-page paper. This was a five-page assignment. And I wrote this 30-page paper, and, and, and not for, to impress anybody. I just loved it. We've all had that experience, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just love the idea of, 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 of learning uh, and, and putting something into a format that would help other people. And so uh, I realized I really loved writing, and I, I, I leaned into that all the way along, and I studied writing. Um, and I, I asked for people to mentor me in that, that way, too. So. By the way, just to inspire anyone, because I always think it's fun to know you can fall in love with something and excel at it, even if early on in your life it wasn't indicated. That's true. When you started out, that wasn't always When I was a little kid, I suffered from severe dyslexia. And uh, like second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, really bad dyslexia. And... Um, 
In fact, all the specialists said he's just always going to struggle. He won't be able to read or, or write very well the rest of his days and, and so forth. And um, I'd like to go back and meet those people and show them the <laughs> shelf of books that I've written, by the way. Um, but uh, it, it was... By uh, God's grace. Yeah, not, not, in, not in spite or anything. Yeah. Um, but I mean, talk about squashing a little kid's spirit, yeah. right? I mean, that was a devastating thing as a kid. And um, in fact, uh, later on in graduate school, I worked with dyslexic uh, kids, yeah. ended up on 60 Minutes talking about uh, yeah. this thing at the Ireland Institute I was at. So um, it, was all, it seemed like early on all the cards were stacked against me, but there was something in me, some little seedling that said, no, I can, I can grow out of this. And so anyway, yeah. I, I would just encourage you to tune into those, those things that you realize as you get to know yourself are a strength and even if it seems like a struggle, and by the way, I guess since I'm dispensing advice here, one other thing that is so essential to, I think, achieving anything in life is uh, delayed gratification. I wish I could <laughs> bottle it for you. I wish I could box it up and say, on your way out today, take a, take a box of delayed gratification uh, because it's one of the single most important disciplines that you can instill for success in life because so many times... We think we want instant, you know, these days. And so, anyway, for what it's worth. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going to tag on to that quickly. Um, Take your time. This is great. <laughs> because, really, it's true. When we decided to be partners in, in this mission, um, we decided to be peers in education. And that took a lot of delayed gratification. Our friends were getting married and creating cozy lives and moving on and having families. We were living in little student housing hovels, um, in graduate school, w working hard at exams and papers, not starting a family. So we didn't, I mean, we lived in, in a studio apartments for over a decade. You know, we had one car for 23 years. We just decided, hey, it's worth us investing our lives in preparing so that we can have something to share. We didn't have a TV for the first five yeah. years of our marriage. You know, life. so we, we just, just we just decided we're going to go without, so that we can have more freedom to do later on in our lives. And looking back, none of those going withouts feel like any kind of deficit at right. the time. There was a little bit of heartache because um, we thought, okay, is this you know, is this really what we're called to? But it really was, and. And we don't regret it for one second. Well, I, I remember we moved into a, a, an apartment complex owned by the seminary called Koinonia. Do you guys know yes. what the Greek word Koinonia means? It means fellowship in Greek. To us, it, mean, it meant miniature because yeah. everything in our life was small. Our bed would not fit in our bedroom, <laughs> yeah. literally. We had our bed in our living room. It was a two-room yep. apartment. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, we had an old-fashioned refrigerator. I remember it didn't even have egg holes in it. Like, do you know what I'm saying? It was just like uh, everything was just weird in this little apartment. And uh, anyway, we decided. We uh, do you remember we used to put up twenty-dollar bills yeah. above the kitchen we sink? Yeah, we literally, you know, uh, we lived on meager incomes, which <laughs> everybody says from their starving student days. But we literally taped. Uh, twenty dollar bills up in our kitchen, and when the last one was gone, we were done until the next month. Yeah. You know, and and it's okay. I mean, th those stories worked for us. And for me, as a woman, I had to keep asking, "Is it okay? I'm delaying having a family." My eighteen year old was born when I was forty. So the choices you make impact how your life unfolds. And yet, we we kept really sensing this is God's pathway for us. So my point isn't just delayed gratification, but it's wisdom for you. You don't have to be. God's not calling you to walk the same path everyone else is. Listen to the path God's calling you to uniquely walk and just be willing to, to say yes. Oh, that's great. I think uh, if, if, if the past holds true, there are people in this room who are going to go out and make an incredible difference in you know, in business, in medicine, in, in uh, education, in all kinds of different vocations, as well as in ministry. And I'm, I'm really hoping that um, something that's been said today will encourage you in thinking about how is it that God can shape me and use me, and how do I, how do I prepare myself or allow myself to be prepared by God, to be shaped by God for this kind of 
uh, for this kind of calling, for a big calling and big influence. You guys, thank you so much for being here. What are you going to talk about tonight at 7 p.m. right here in the chapel? Well, this is going to shock you, but we're going to talk about relationships. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit. Uh, um, we we, we kind of always have a general sense of what we're going to talk about, and then we kind of get a feel and just kind of let the Holy Spirit uh, kind of work in that moment too. But that's the plan at this point to talk about uh, uh, one of the most important things that you can do for your relationships. Yeah. That's perfect. We'll see you guys here tonight. And uh, Megan, come and close, close the service for us. Please express your thanks to these guys.